In simplest terms, optimization is choosing inputs that will result in the best possible outputs, or making things the best that they can be. This can mean a variety of things, from deciding on the most effective allocation of available resources, to producing a design with the best characteristics, to choosing control variables that will cause the system to behave as desired. Optimization problems often involve the words maximize or minimize. Optimization is also useful when there are limits or constraints on the resources involved, or boundaries restricting the possible solutions. Let's take a look at a very simple example of an optimization problem. Given a parabola, choose x to get the largest y. We can try different values of x to see the resulting y value. Eventually, we can find the maximum y value by choosing x here. You may have also solved this type of problem in calculus class by taking the derivative of the parabola and setting it equal to zero. Now for this simple problem, it is easy to see the correct solution. For more complicated problems, it can be difficult to immediately see the correct solution. Guessing and checking can take much too long, and it can be difficult to find the values where the derivative is equal to zero. Optimization can be applied to a huge variety of situations and problems. For example, choosing the optimal location for a warehouse to minimize shipment times to potential customers. Designing a bridge that can carry the maximum load possible for a given cost. Choosing the optimal build order for units in a strategy game to amass the strongest army possible in a given time. Controlling the insulin output from an artificial pancreas to minimize the difference between actual and desired blood sugar levels throughout the day. Designing an airplane wing to minimize weight while maintaining strength. Selecting the best set of stocks to invest in to maximize returns based on predicted performance. Controlling the temperature of a chemical reaction throughout a process to maximize the purity of a desired product. As you can see, optimization is a powerful tool in many applications. This is just a small sampling of the many fields that make use of optimization techniques to improve the quality of their solutions. If something can be modeled mathematically, it can usually be optimized. The objective function is the value that you are trying to optimize. For example, if you were trying to make a square as big as possible, the area would be the objective function. One of the main goals of optimization is to try to improve the value of the objective function, whether that means minimizing it, maximizing it, or trying to bring it to a certain value. Looking at the objective function value is one of the most common ways to tell how well an optimization has worked. In the case where there are multiple objectives, they are usually summed, multiplied, or otherwise combined to form a single value. In dynamic optimization, control variables also form part of the objective function. Optimization problems are commonly written in the form minimize f of x. Here, f is the objective function. Other examples of, ob of objective functions might be to minimize cost, maximize speed, minimize weight, maximize profit, or minimize waste. The specific objective function chosen depends on the problem to be solved and your goals in solving it. Decision variables are the inputs to your problem that your optimizer is allowed to change to try to improve the objective function value. In our square example from before, the decision variables would be the lengths of the two sides. These variables are also called design variables or manipulated variables. As was stated before, optimization problems are commonly written in the form minimize f of x. Here, x 
represents one or more decision variables. In general, the more decision variables there are, the more difficult an optimization problem becomes to solve. Derivatives and gradients describe the slope of a function, whether it increases or decreases in a given direction. In multiple directions, or dimensions, this is called the gradient. Finding gradients for a function is an important part of optimization and can be accomplished in a number of ways, including analytic differentiation, numerical differentiation, and automatic differentiation. Most optimization packages include methods for finding function gradients. Constraints describe where the optimizer cannot go, or additional conditions that must be met for a successful solution. For example, when optimizing the size of a square, we could add the constraint that the lengths of the two sides multiplied together is less than 5. This is an inequality constraint. We can also add equality constraints, such as a plus b equals 10, or a times b divided by a plus b equals 3. Other examples of constraints might be a bridge with a constraint that it must hold at least 80,000 pounds, or a chemical mixture that must be at least 99% pure. Optimal solutions tend to be right up against the constraints. Picture a ball rolling downhill and encountering a wall. One important distinction to note in optimization is that between continuous and discrete, or integer variables. Many variables can be represented as a continuous range of values such as size, weight, speed, or concentration. For example, a car can go 5 miles per hour, 10 miles per hour, or anywhere in between. However, other variables can only be represented by discrete quantities such as the number of holes that should be drilled in a board, or a pipe diameter chosen from available models. These are often called integer variables. Other variables are best represented by binary values, 1 or 0, such as whether a switch is off or on. The types of variables involved in a problem affect the optimization methods that can be used. In general, optimization problems involving binary or integer variables are much more difficult than continuous problems because they produce discontinuous derivatives. Symbolic differentiation, numerical differentiation, and automatic differentiation. First, symbolic differentiation. Think back to taking derivatives in calculus class. You would apply rules to differentiate a function step by step, eventually ending up with an analytic solution for the derivative of the function. Symbolic differentiation works the same way. The computer applies the rules of differentiation step by step to a function and returns an analytic expression for the derivative. It can then use that expression to obtain the derivative of a function at a specific point. This can be useful, but has a couple of drawbacks. First, some functions in your program may not have analytic derivatives. Second, symbolic differentiation takes your entire program and returns one giant expression for the derivative, which may be very long and slow to evaluate. The second technique is numerical differentiation. The classic form of numerical differentiation is finite difference. Finite differencing essentially takes the slope of a function by comparing the function value at different points. For example, in a first-order finite difference, the function is evaluated at the desired point, and also at a point a little bit further on. Then the slope of the line between the points is computed. The closer the two points are together, the more accurately that slope represents the true derivative of the function. The major problem with finite differencing is that computers have a limit on how closely they can put the two points together before errors are introduced due to machine precision. 
This means that finite differencing can't return the exact derivative of a function, only a close estimate. It's worth noting that there are some more advanced methods such as complex step that can help to get around this problem. Numerical differentiation also becomes very slow for large dimensional problems. The third technique we'll discuss today is automatic or algorithmic differentiation. Automatic differentiation is similar to symbolic differentiation in that it applies a series of rules to obtain a derivative from a function. The difference is that automatic differentiation is specifically designed to work on computer code. At a basic level, all computer code is made up of simple instructions such as addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Automatic differentiation uses the chain rule to break the instructions your code is giving down into their simplest parts, and then differentiates each part. The individual parts are then brought back together to give you your derivative. Automatic differentiation provides exact derivatives to machine precision and is much faster than finite differencing for large problems. The drawback is that it is more difficult to implement. To summarize, symbolic differentiation is useful for gaining insight into a problem, but it's slow and inefficient. Numerical differentiation is easy to program, but inaccurate. Automatic differentiation is fast and accurate, but more difficult to code. Gradient-based solvers use derivatives to find the optimum value of a function. To understand how this works, imagine that you are hiking on a mountainside, trying to find your way to a campsite at the bottom of the mountain. How would you know where to go? Perhaps you could follow a trail, look at a map, or use a GPS. You might even be able to see your destination and head straight there. Now, imagine that you have no map, no GPS, no trail. And there are trees all around you that keep you from seeing anything but the area immediately around yourself. Now what? Knowing nothing except for the fact that the campsite is at the bottom of the mountain, one possible option is to head downhill. You could look around, evaluate the slope of the mountain in the small area you can see, and walk in the direction with the steepest downhill slope. You could continue doing this, pausing once in a while to find the best path forward and eventually make it to the campsite. On a basic level, this is the same thing that gradient-based algorithms do. There are three main steps. Search direction, step size, and convergence check. The first step is to pick a direction to go. The solver evaluates this step, the slope, by taking the derivative at its current location. In one dimension, this derivative is called the slope. In more than one dimension, this is called the gradient. The solver then uses this, this information together with other rules to pick a direction to go. This direction is called the search direction. The next step is to decide how far to go in the chosen direction. You don't want to go too far in one direction, or you might end up going back up a different mountain. However, you do want to go far enough to make some progress towards your goal. The value the solver chooses is called the step size. Once a direction and a step size are chosen, the solver moves in the chosen direction. Then it checks to see if it has reached the bottom. If not, it uses the slope again to pick a new direction and step size. This continues until the solver reaches the bottom of the mountain, or the minimum. We call this convergence. There are many variations on the way that these steps are performed, but these are the basic ideas behind how a gradient-based optimization algorithm works. Let's take a look at this on a real function. We'll try to find the minimum of the equation x cubed plus 15x squared plus y cubed plus 15y squared. We'll start out by visualizing the function. This is a plot of the function values over a range from negative 10 to 10 in both directions. Notice how the function slopes down towards a minimum in the center. To begin, 
we'll need to give the, the optimizer an initial guess. Let's choose x equals 8 and y equals 8. Another way we can represent this information is with a contour plot, where the lines represent constant levels, or function values. We can watch now as the optimizer chooses a search direction and takes a step, chooses a search direction and takes a step, chooses a direction and takes a step. Eventually, it reaches the minimum point at x equals 0, y equals 0. Gradient-based algorithms have their own strengths and weaknesses. They are widely used, have fast performance, and scale well to large problems. However, they do require smooth, continuous function gradients, and computing those gradients can be computationally expensive. Many gradient-based optimizers are also susceptible to finding local minima rather than a global optimum, meaning that they will find the bottom of the closest valley rather than the lowest point on the whole map. Gradient-based optimizers are a powerful tool, but as with any optimization problem, it takes experience and practice to know which method is the right one to use in your situation. The main difference between gradient-based and gradient-free algorithms is that gradient-free algorithms do not require derivatives. This means that they can be used for optimization problems where derivatives can't be obtained or are difficult to obtain. This can include functions that are discrete, discontinuous, or noisy. This makes gradient-free algorithms very flexible in the types of problems they can be applied to. The major disadvantage of gradient-free algorithms is that they are generally much slower than gradient-based algorithms. There are a huge variety of gradient-free algorithms, and many variations on those algorithms. Let's take a look at some of the most common. First off, exhaustive search. The simplest and most inefficient gradient-free optimization method is to try every possible solution and pick the best possible answer. While this approach may work for very small problems, with larger problems it quickly becomes impossible. Next, genetic algorithms. Genetic algorithms are another type of gradient-free optimization algorithm. Genetic algorithms are based on the ideas of biology and evolution. Instead of proposing just a single solution to an optimization problem, a genetic algorithm generates many possible solutions that form a population. For example, if we were trying to optimize x and y, a population will be formed from various combinations of values of x and y. The solutions are scored using a fitness function or objective function to decide which solutions are better than others. These candidate solutions are then recombined so that the best solutions reproduce to form a new generation of solutions with the best traits of the previous solutions. This continues until improvement stops or until the maximum number of generations is reached. Let's observe the progress of a genetic algorithm on the function f of x is equal to x cubed plus 15x squared plus y cubed plus 15y squared. Here's a two-dimensional contour plot of that function with an initial population plotted. The minimum of this function is x equals 0, y equals 0. Let's watch as the population evolves over time, moving closer and closer to the minimum point. Eventually we see that the genetic algorithm converges the population to the minimum. Particle swarm is similar to a genetic algorithm in that it creates a population, or in this case, a swarm of possible solutions at each iteration. Each solution or particle in the swarm has a direction and a velocity. At each iteration, the movement of the particle is determined by a mixture of the direction it is currently moving, 
the direction of the best point it has found in the past, and the direction of the best point the whole swarm has discovered. The idea is that more and more particles will eventually move towards areas where better solutions are found, and that the swarm will eventually converge to the optimal value. Let's see this in action. We see again that an initial swarm is created. Notice that particle swarm searches the space in a slightly different way than genetic algorithms do. But still, it eventually begins to converge and eventually finds the minimum point once again. Annealing is a process in which metal or glass is heated and then allowed to cool at a controlled rate. Annealing changes the properties of a metal, making it more ductile and workable. Simulated annealing uses the idea of slowly cooling metal in an optimization algorithm. An initial guess is taken, then another solution is randomly guessed near the previous solution. This new solution is evaluated to see if it is better than the previous solution. Initially, some bad solutions are accepted to allow the algorithm to explore, perhaps finding its way out of a valley towards a better solution. As time goes on, the temperature is reduced and fewer bad solutions are accepted. Eventually, only solutions that are better than the previous one are accepted. It's a bit like a ball bouncing on a vibrating surface. As the vibration decreases, the ball bounces less and less. Eventually, it will come to a stop, hopefully at the minimum point. The Nelder Mead downhill simplex algorithm is another commonly used gradient free algorithm that uses a triangular shape or simplex to search for an optimal solution. The simplex shape flip flops towards its goal, growing, shrinking, and changing its shape according to a set of rules. Eventually, it should converge to the optimal solution. Along with those already mentioned, many other gradient-free optimization algorithms exist. A large number of these are based on analogies to natural processes, such as ant colony optimization, particle swarm, harmony search, artificial bee colony algorithm, bees algorithm, glowworm swarm optimization, shuffled frog leaping algorithm, imperialistic competitive algorithm, river formation dynamics, intelligent water drops algorithm, gravitational search algorithm, cuckoo search, bat algorithm, flower pollination algorithm, cuttlefish optimization algorithm, artificial swarm intelligence. Many of these algorithms contain similar mathematical ideas concealed by differing analogies. In summary, a large variety of gradient-free optimization methods exist, each with their own strengths and weaknesses. Some of the most commonly used methods are genetic algorithms, particle swarm, simulated annealing, and the nelder mead simplex algorithm. In general, gradient-free methods are easier to implement and have the advantage of not requiring derivatives. This means that they can be applied to problems that are discrete, discontinuous, or otherwise non-differentiable. Many of the algorithms also do a good job of searching for a global solution rather than a local solution. On the downside, gradient-free algorithms tend to be very slow for large problems. Many of the algorithms are also stochastic, meaning that they are based on chance and will not always find the same solution. Finally, there is no guarantee that these algorithms will return an optimal solution meaning that while the solution found might be better than what you started with, you won't know if it's the best solution possible. Thank you for watching.